I-70 is the fifth longest interstate highway in America, running over 2,000 miles, starting in Utah and ending at this interchange in Baltimore, Maryland. Now, obviously you'll notice something very strange about this interchange. It ends very abruptly at a park and ride. This is very clearly not the original plan for this interstate, because why would it end at a park and ride instead of continuing to a more deserving ending to such an important interstate? It doesn't make sense. Well, this is Leakin Park. It's the largest park in all of Baltimore and has been preserved for over 100 years. When I-70 was being planned into the city, it was supposed to go straight through Leakin Park, leveling over a mile of preserved woodlands and trails. But construction was stopped by freeway revolts led by an activist and future politician, Barbara Mikulski. If the citizens of Baltimore didn't do something about it, the highway would have leveled some of the poorest neighbors in the city, as well as some of the best parks they had to offer. Things like this happen all over the country, changing the history of American cities forever. So today we're going to talk about the importance of freeway revolts and show exactly what they did to make American cities a better place. Before that though, I wanted to very quickly ask if you would consider subscribing to the channel. I make content like this every week, talking about different aspects of American geography and the interstate system. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, I highly recommend you click the subscribe button. Thank you. Baltimore made itself one of the most important cities for freeway revolts stopping some of the most disgusting designs from being created. I think it's also important that I talk about the Franklin Mulberry Expressway, commonly known as the Freeway to Nowhere. There was originally a plan to build I-170 from Gwent Falls straight into downtown Baltimore. However, after starting work on this, completely disconnecting neighborhoods of West Baltimore, the community put a stop to it, ending the project in its tracks. I-170 was canceled, and the already finished portion of it was connected to Highway 40. So now there's a 1.5 mile freeway in Baltimore, which practically nobody uses, disconnecting neighborhoods with basically no real reason. It's one of the saddest examples of highways in America and what they do to cities. Overall, places in the east didn't have as much of a problem with highways, being able to put a stop to them because the cities were already built up, and it made it a lot easier to justify not building them. But the western U.S. was not so lucky with the suburbanization also leading to freeways being needed to commute to center cities. Denver's a great example of this, with freeways all around the city. Most present-day anti-highway activists would use Denver to show a city with too many freeways. But if it weren't for the freeway revolt in the 1960s, Denver could be so much worse. So this is a map of freeways in the city at that time. This isn't that bad for a city of its size, but this was at the peak of expansion, with engineers planning new freeways all over the city. There was a major plan to build a skyline freeway from the downtown through the western suburbs of the city, terminating in Morrison. There was also a plan to build the Columbine Freeway from downtown through the south suburbs, terminating in the Highlands Ranch area. Going even farther, there was a plan for Mountain South Freeway, going from the downtown through the eastern suburbs of the city. So now looking at this map, it seems a little crowded, but that's not all of them. This is a full map of the proposed freeways through the Denver metropolitan area. So if you thought the last map was looking crowded, you're probably amazed by this. A pure monstrosity of urban and suburban highways that would likely ruin Denver if it came to fruition. But it didn't, because the residents of the area were not going to let this happen. They weren't going to allow neighborhoods to be leveled. Now obviously if you look at this map, you'll see some of these proposed freeways did in fact happen. Most notably C-470. Originally, there was a design for a spur route to go all the way around the Denver area. It was approved by the Denver City Council, and they began engineering and environmental impact studies. After a few months, the studies went under analysis with negative feedback. The Denver Department of Health was opposed to the Interstate Beltway on the grounds that it would violate the Federal Clean Air Act. Other studies compared the proposed I-470 to the I-25 and I-225 freeways, suggesting that alternate uses for the land other than freeways would be more environmentally friendly. So the governor of Colorado ordered the construction of the Beltway to cease. But obviously some sort of freeway was still needed, so the commission was established to figure out what that would be. After looking over many options, it was decided a Grand Parkway would be built, known as Centennial Parkway, or C-470. Today the road is mostly built to interstate standards, meaning the results did not really work in this instance. But what the revolts did do is create a toll road, E-470, located on the east side of the metro. Basically, because they weren't getting interstate funding, the only way they could afford to build it is if they got extra money from tolls. Anyways, I felt C-470 was an important highway in the history of freeway revolts, and it deserved to be mentioned. Moving out to the west coast, we have another major player in the history of freeway revolts, that being San Francisco. There's a great video by City Beautiful talking specifically about San Francisco, so if you're interested in a more in-depth look at the city's freeway history, check that out. I'll be talking very briefly about how these results absolutely shaped San Francisco, an already very densely populated city that has always struggled for room. 
So in 1955, a proposal was put forward to build highways all throughout the city, massacring the downtown, the waterfront, and Golden Gate Park, just to name a few important landmarks that would be destroyed. Opposition came viciously towards the waterfront highway specifically, which was absolutely disgusting to look at, and ruined the downtown area for a long time. In 1959, seven of the ten planned freeways were canceled, being a large step in the ongoing battle taking place in San Francisco. Protests continued, leading to the cancellation of the freeway through the Panhandle and Golden Gate Park in 1964. And in 1966, an extension of the Embarcadero Freeway to Golden Gate Bridge was canceled. Over the next 19 years, opposition to the Embarcadero Freeway continued, and in 1985, a vote resulted in its demolition. Over the next few decades, the entire portion of the Central Freeway north of Market Street was demolished, with the top deck being destroyed in 1996 and the lower deck in 2003. San Francisco residents have almost always been anti-freeway, and the revolts have continued over the past 60 years. It's pretty crazy just how much San Francisco would have changed if these freeways weren't met with immediate opposition. But because they were, the city has easily made itself the chief force of interstate revolts in America. There are two more very important cities that need to be talked about before you can have the knowledge of freeway revolts in America. Those are Boston and New York. These two cities are arguably the most historic of any in America, making it even more important that they stop the freeway boom in their cities. So starting off with Boston, you probably all know the more recent events with the Big Dig, where I-93 was sent underground through the downtown area and another tunnel was built to the east. This reclaimed miles of land from the monster of urban freeways and was an expensive project to make Boston even better than it already is. But that project is just recent. Boston has dealt with the exact same situation as every other American city, where the engineers of the 1950s and 60s decided it needed freeways absolutely everywhere. Let's start by taking a look at their current map, which is not so bad with the knowledge that most of the downtown freeways are underground. Now let's take a look at their proposed freeway map. At this time, it wasn't even a thought that a highway could go underground, meaning all of these would be flattening historic neighborhoods of this beautiful area. The highway that brought the most attention to protesters was the more urban beltway shown in green. Every neighborhood and block of Boston has some sort of history, and this highway would flatten areas in Cambridge, disconnecting MIT from Harvard, and going straight through valuable land that we would never get back if protesters were not there for us. So protests were all over Boston, trying their hardest to protect the city. They couldn't stop at all, and the central artery going through downtown Boston was built. Obviously, it was moved underground, as I said earlier, but lots of historic areas were destroyed during the building of it. Citizens of the city managed to stop most of the worst interstates from being built, preserving the city to an extent. Next up is New York, where there is simply too much to talk about throughout the state, and I could literally spend minutes just listing out the freeways that were canceled in the state. Here's a list of freeways canceled on Long Island alone. Here's Hudson Valley, here's Albany, and here's Buffalo. New York as a state had so many freeway revolts that it's impossible to cover them all. Because I literally haven't gone over New York City yet. There's a reason I saved New York for last, because we have a lot more to go through, and I'm really not looking forward to writing this part of the script. Anyways, red means current freeways, and blue means canceled freeways. In another video, I talked about a man named Robert Moses. He played a major role in designing of freeways and interstates in New York City. He had major plans for a map of new freeways throughout the city including two that would be built straight through Midtown and Lower Manhattan. The borough instead made the correct decision to keep interstates outside of the interior Manhattan, saving the special feel walking around the area it gives you. He also designed highways in Brooklyn, a borough that really doesn't have that many freeways present day. Brooklyn also doesn't really have any interior freeways, something Robert Moses wanted. Staten Island was next up, a place that I personally think has a good amount of freeways right now, and would suffer from any more. Moses' design would effectively double the amount of freeways in the borough. Queens and the Bronx didn't really have many canceled freeways, with most of the major protesting coming out of the three boroughs I just talked about. So basically what happened is that Moses had a master plan of the Manhattan Skyway, a massive project that would blow any American engineering out of the water. Public opposition put a stop to this, halting the freeway rush in New York City. With this, Nelson Rockefeller basically halted all the new interstates in the city and stopped places like Brooklyn and Staten Island from being polluted with freeways. I think the city of New York was anti-freeway from the start, making it a lot easier to stop the construction, because there wasn't really much of a demand from anyone. The city had a better public transportation system than any others in the U.S., which also lowered the need for urban highways. So that's all of the specific instances I wanted to touch on throughout the United States, hopefully giving you an idea of how all this went down. If I had more time, I'd go through many more instances in cities that made the interstate revolt so important. Because this stuff was basically going on everywhere in the 1960s when urban freeways were at their peak. But there simply isn't enough time in an already long video for that. 
because there's still more to say about how important freeway revolting was, and I don't want to have to miss any integral parts of the story. Something that can't be avoided when talking about this is the obvious racism involved with freeway building in this time period. As many of the viewers watching this video may already know, land in predominantly African American and minority neighborhoods was much cheaper to buy out, meaning when they were routing freeways, they would send them straight through the already poor neighborhoods, splitting communities with complete disregard for the residents of these communities. It's one of the most embarrassing and saddest parts of the interstate system and its construction. Now why this is important to the story is that without freeway revolts, the state of America's cities would be so much worse. If cities had twice as many freeways as they do right now, where do you think most of them would be built? It would be through these neighborhoods. These protests to stop freeways from leveling homes are important because of what they preserved. If nobody was there trying to stop this, there would just be more and more built. Because for every urban freeway, houses get destroyed and the lives of the people in those houses are changed in the worst way. So yeah, that's what the interstate revolt in America was all about. People who didn't want to see their cities get destroyed for the sake of convenient and easy travel which would encourage people to live farther from city centers, sprawling American cities even more than they already are. These people went out and did something about it, making America a better place. Thanks for watching.